something is seen. Um, so the, the normal way of a child going to the kindergarten is to know how to run to shelter. The glass of the school was always painted black or uh, navy blue, not to reflect the lights during the air raid. Um, so that's, that's a normal way of a life in the Middle East for a child six years old at that time. In 1973, uh, the 6th of October war happened and there was a ceasefire. And for the first time, uh, the air raid uh, in Cairo stopped. And um, the child looked at the TV, there was uh, white tanks and white armored cars coming from airplanes with a very fancy soldiers wearing blue helmets and blue berets. And at that time, uh, this child, which is me, uh, I asked my, my father at that time, I told him, who's these guys? I never seen this army before because I know the Israeli army emblem and sign and I know the Egyptian army. These guys wearing uh, different clothes and their arms are white. He told me these are the UN. Uh, they came here to maintain peace and to protect civilians. I was really astonished. I mean, as a six years old, I discovered that uh, no more air raids. I can go peacefully to my uh, school. Um, so at that time, I told my father, one day I will join this team. And uh, it was very emotional for me at that time, actually, that uh, for six years old child to, to see this is my dream. Uh, one day I will join this team to maintain peace globally, to save lives. Um, and I'll do my best to do that. Almost 30 years later, I joined the UN uh, and I prepared myself to do that. I went to the law school, I became a prosecutor, I became a judge, I studied uh, and competed like you guys are doing. One of the basic tools that enabled me to go to work with the UN is having my LLM at Notre Dame, studying human rights that enabled me to join the UN later on. Um, just to tell you that uh, joining the UN uh, is not like a profession that I'm trying to improve my life for, but at that time, it was a dream for a human being that really value the meaning of peace, really value the meaning of security and justice. Uh, and I uh, devoted my life for that till I joined my work. Um, I'm doing a job that I really like. Every day I feel uh, that I, uh, I make a difference in the life of other people. Uh, saving different lives, changing the views of justice, um, accountability, recognition of victims. Uh, that's what in peacekeeping what we do. Um, coming back to the, the topic of the discussion of today, I'm sorry if I started with a personal story, but to just give you perspective, that uh, sometime you have to follow your heart. Uh, it is not only follow the money <laughs> as a lawyer, but sometime it is important that you follow your heart to do what you like and what you believe in. And I remember quite well, uh, the first mission I joined was Afghanistan. This was in almost 2005. At that time, was a, I was a young judge doing my doctoral degree in Chicago. And all of a sudden, my supervisor at that time, his name is Sharif Basuni, God bless his soul. He's very famous. He's, we can call him the godfather of the ICC. He's, he drafted the, the Rome Statute, actually. And I did my doctorate degree with him. And he was the special rapporteur for human rights in Afghanistan. And I was one of his doctoral degree students. While he was there, uh, the mission asked him, he told him, the Afghan justice system uh, is really devastated. And, they need a lot of reform. The problem is most of our uh, lawyers are uh, graduate from Western countries. They don't know the Sharia legal system, the Islamic system. And the judges insist that they need some expert who can help them develop the, just, the justice system based on what they do. And he, he told them, I have a young judge working with me in doctor degree and he recommended my name. And this is how I entered the UN at the time. Competitiveness was less. Now every post, the one I start opening, 
uh, for job uh, announcement for post in my team, every post with the UN, more than 25,000 or 30,000 application come to us. So I tell you how much it's became very competitive and more tough now for uh, lawyers to join the UN. Uh, almost 20 years ago, I, it, it was a little bit easier. And that's why I think the topic that I decided to specialize in was Islamic law, because the market at that time, there was no lot of competitiveness. Uh, most of the Western universities uh, who are very good caliber of lawyers, uh, they have a very brief topic about Islamic law or the uh, Sharia legal system, which is over 59 countries are under this umbrella of Sharia legal system. As you know, there is like the common law, the Anglo-American legal system and the civil law or the continental legal system in Europe, and then sometimes the Germanic law or the Soviet legal system. But also one of the key or the major legal system in the world is the Islamic legal system, which is 59 countries are influenced with it. There is no crystal clear uh, one legal system by itself. It's always now mix and match between the ideas. That's why it's important for you guys to enable you, if you are willing to work with the UN, to start uh, working and focus in comparative legal systems. So we can have a glimpse of how legal systems working all over the world. Because one of the challenges I faced when I went to Afghanistan, the only legal system I know at the time was the Egyptian legal system, which is based on Sharia combined with the Code Napoleon, which is the French legal system. Uh, that's domestic. And that's only my uh, uh, professional experience as a prosecutor and a young judge. And academically, I uh, totally understand from Notre Dame the regional and international protection systems of human rights. And I studied all uh, very interesting topics, international law. Uh, however, as soon as I hit the ground in Kabul, I discovered that the things are not as I studied or as I practiced in Egypt. The issue also that most of our, the lawyers going to post-conflict and a conflict zone, they think that their justice system is the best in the world and they want to impose it on the country where they go, which is the first mistake. I think that the, the first lesson before you go and work in a certain country, do your homework. Uh, get their constitution, their basic laws, the criminal law, criminal procedures, and read it. Try to understand how the legal system in that country is functioning and based on that, you start tailoring um, what's needed to improve it. Try to identify the gaps, the loop loopholes, the overlaps in the justice system, whether it's in the legal system or the judicial system, the structural problem or institutional problem or human resource problem, or financial problem. And you start listing all these challenges. And from your experience, whether academically or professional, you start suggesting solutions. As a judge, I've been trained all my life to find solutions for problems. So it is what I've been practicing all my life, finding solutions, seeking justice, finding the truth. So by that, that's the, the starting point, baseline assessment. Do assessment of the country before you go. Uh, and sometimes I make it as a joke. I think when I work with peacekeeping, I'm, I'm like a tailor. I go to my client, I take the measures, and start asking him how he would like the, the clothes will be. He would like to have a tuxedo suit or he prefer a jalabia in the Middle East or maybe something very flexible uh, based on the climate and culture, morals and values of the person. Uh, the problem most of my colleagues did at that time, they go with the impression that the people in Afghanistan want to wear a tuxedo, which they don't. They don't want to wear something that's not fitting their culture or morals and values. They want to wear the kameez, which is what they wear, and the thing that they are flexible with. And I mean by the kameez or the tuxedo or here the suit is the justice system. Because uh, one of the things I realized also, I call it the justice relativism. Uh, every country, the justice system in it is, is accumulative layers of morals and values of this society that defining later on on a shape of laws. And I have a couple of examples to, to clarify my point. Um, once I was working in South Sudan, 
and I have an appointment with a judge in a town called Wau, uh, the town called Wau itself. So I'm trying to be uh, um, accurate in my timing and I'm trying to identify where is the court. The time is passing. I couldn't find the court. I start to get nervous. Being a judge, I know judges are obnoxious and they don't want to wait for someone. So, <laughs> so I know that I'm putting myself in trouble. So I stopped one of the peasants. I told him the location telling me that I'm very close to the court, but I can't find the court. Where is the court? I have an appointment with the chief judge of this court. So this peasant pointed his finger to a tree and he told me, here it is, the court is the tree. So I went and looked there, there was a big tree and there was a very um, humble chair where a person sitting on it and the other people sitting at the ground. And he told me, here's the judge. For me, the scene itself, I was flabbergasted. I was, oh my God, I come from a system where the judge sit in a court with a very big pillar it looked like a temple. So the people would come and think that this is the pearl of wisdom that they would hear. And the justice and true will be coming between these pillar of justice. So the, the building itself make the impression for the people to accept the court decision. So going all of a sudden, and I discovered that the court is only a tree and the judge is sitting on a very, like, uh, I don't want to say filthy, but very humble chair. And the, like and the litigant sitting at the floor, that was really shock for me. And later on, uh, I, I attended a conference where other rule of law officers for the UN convene. And I have a colleague, I think he was from, I think Somalia at that time. And I told him, could you believe in South Sudan, the court is just a tree? So how do you de deliver justice there? And he starts smiling and he told me, I wish we have trees in Somal Somalia so we can have courts. So. For them, even, it's more difficult because there's no trees, so they cannot have buildings, so there is no court. So for them, the, the, the image of justice is different from one culture to another. I remember when I was studying with, like you guys, 25 years ago, there was the process of impeachment of uh, Clinton, President Clinton, because of the Monica Lewinsky crisis, if you know what the case I'm talking about. And we were exactly like you, we were international students sitting together. And I have a French colleague, actually, he was listening, watching the TV, and we were uh, watching the process or the procedures for impeaching Clinton. And he, as a French, he was very passionate, and he say, this is very ridiculous. We have President Francois Mitterrand, he have his own mistress, and uh, he have uh, a, like a girl, baby girl from this relation, and nobody cared, this is his own life why people interfere in the personal life of a president. So another American colleague, he said, no, we are, we are impeaching Clinton because he lied under oath. And that's a big thing. And we have another colleague from Pakistan at that time. And I asked him, Ali, what do you think? And he said, well, this guy should, should be stoned because he commit adultery. So we have someone think that it's a crime and the penalty should be death penalty by stoning. And we have the French gentleman think that there is no crime and this is the private life. And the American think that he should not be president. And you know what? The three of them were right because everyone thinks justice based on the morals and values where they come from. So that's why it's very important when you work with the United Nations, you don't go with the prejudgment. You just go with an open mind to the country where you will be working and listen more, be active listener listen to what's going on, start to understand how they view justice, fairness, equality, morals, and values. And based on that, you start to make the bridge between these structure of morals and values with the international standards of human rights and due process. You start in building the bridge and try to link between these justice norms. That's a good example that, and a good lesson that I learned. At that time, actually, they said, oh, you are judge, you go do the job. So <laughs> there was no any training or induction course for us to, to prepare us to work in a post-conflict uh, environment. Now I developed for our newcomers as a UN staff with colleagues of us, of course, how to do that. We have induction, very comprehensive induction course, preparing new uh, international experts. Uh, what they will expect, what they will face, what's expecting from them, 
uh, how they can do the business, how they can coordinate between international interlocutors, how they can coordinate between national interlocutors, uh, how to make fundraising for justice, how to do baseline assessment. For example, when I went, I think in 2005, I start to see who's my audience, who's the judges in Afghanistan. Um, I discovered, of course, that a lot of the judges, they were just simply tribal leaders uh, in their communities. And because this country had been for a very long time in a war conflict, a civil war, invasion from the Soviets, later on civil war again, and later on again, uh, invaded by uh, American troops after September 11. So this country have been really devastated in its infrastructure. So we made a baseline assessment. I discovered very shocking information. For example, we discovered that 11% of the judges at that time in 2005, they, didn't prove, they couldn't prove that they know how to write and read. They don't have any educational certificate to prove that they know how to write and read. 40% of the judges were graduated from what they call madrasa, which is a religious high school education that teach basic about Islamic law. As if I'm saying high school could be a judge in the state. And the rest have a law degree. So I speak about 51% of uh, personnel in the justice system has no idea about justice and law as lawyers should be and law school should teach. That tell you how much challenging I was facing. Of course, another challenge was corruption. Most of these judges uh, used the, the, their position for bribery and embezzlements and a lot of stuff. So a nepotism. So that's another thing. So for us, it's very important when we start working with the judges, we do vetting process for these judges to, to be sure that they are the right person. Um, again, looking for gender parity and gender mainstreaming at the time, um, that we would like to have balance between men and women uh, as member of the judiciary, whether the prosecution office or judges. Um, and we actually at that time, we succeeded to do that. I remember the first time I met the chief justice of Afghanistan. Uh, he was a very old guy with a big beard, with a big uh, desk in front of him and nothing but like a small book. I'm sorry. And, and he has a whip in front of him. This is Justice Shinwari at the time, as I remember. Later on, three years later, we have another justice became the chief justice of Afghanistan. His name is Justice Azimi, who have a doctoral degree from the States and from Azhar University, which is a religious university in Egypt. And the nine chief, like the nine judges of the Supreme Court, all of them are well-educated. So I, I'm very proudly to say that after three years, we managed to improve how the image of the justice system in Afghanistan by getting capable personnel, uh, working with the Afghan to, to, um, to reform the legal system, adopting new norms, new laws that uh, observe human rights, respect, protect due process and human rights. There was tons of cases, I can tell you, we can take all the day. I'm not sure, uh, John, how much time allocated for me because, you know, the big challenge giving the floor for a lawyer, he will never or she will never stop talking. So just let me know <laughs> what's the level, uh, the time allocated for me. And after that, we can open the floor for discussion. Yeah, you have another 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, my God, I'm still speaking only in Afghanistan. I didn't go to Syria or Sudan or Somalia or Iraq. So anyway. Um, the other part of my job, actually, I thought of myself working in a conflict zone. It's like Indiana Jones approach. I go to this place, which is extremely dangerous. I remember my car given to me in Syria when I went in 20, uh, 2012 as observer trying to monitor and release uh, arbitrary detainees. You know, the UN cars is like armored car, white car with the UN, big black UN uh, emblem over it. That's, I think when I went there, it was April, 2012. By the end of the year, this car looked like a Swiss cheese because of the bullet, hole, bullet holes in it. It was full of bullets where the snipers always shooting us. Um, and actually during that time, the Free Syrian Army and the Syrian Army were blaming each other that they are attacking us. So we are and there, we don't have even a Swiss knife to protect ourselves. We were just observers who are trying to maintain peace between the two parties. 
So our work actually, it's not that easy. People think that the UN is a very fancy receptions. Uh, people gather to fundraise with the secretary general at uh, the secretariat in Manhattan or in Geneva. No, that's not the real what we face. These are the HQ, but we have most of the UN personnel are in the field, in the mud, uh, whether in a tropical place with a lot of hazard, weather disease. Uh, I worked in Liberia in the top of the Ebola crisis. I went there and tried to maintain justice system in, in Liberia during the pandemic. During this pandemic, I'm now colleague from Iraq. I, I remember the first day I arrived in Iraq here last year, after I left the, the airport by 10 minutes, there was three missiles hitting the airport behind me. I see the explosions behind me. And at night, I have another three missiles hitting the American embassy just the, the one block away from me. So it's always conflict zone is, is difficult and a lot of hazard and security concerns. In Sudan, uh, it was completely different approach as well. Uh, we have a hostile regime during al-Bashir. He was a dictator and uh, he was his hostile totally against the UN. So this is another uh, environment where a government don't want us to be there. They want to hide violations of human rights. But you have to navigate your way in order to maintain peace with the people. Um, like I told you in Syria, uh, I've been prosecuted for almost 10 years and I go for uh, the morgue on a daily basis and I've seen all kinds of homicide cases. But the kind of killing I've seen in Syria and the massacres, I couldn't stop myself. I was in one of them, like in the villages, uh, isolated villages, that the people were massacred there. Children were massacred. And I've seen how they, it was very graphic actually. They smashed the skulls of the kids with stones. And I go there and I see the fractions of their brain everywhere in the floor. And I have kids and I have my iPad in front of me and I having the video trying to describe the crime scene. And all of a sudden I discover that the iPad is full of my teardrops. Uh, it was very emotional actually to go and see how people can kill other human beings this way. It was very brutal actually. Uh, so that's the kind of environment that we face. We go there. Um, I remember some time when the Free Syrian Army abducted some officers. I managed to stop the shooting squad from shooting these people five minutes before they got killed. So as if you are having eruption of a volcano and you're trying to get the people away from the volcano site while the lava is coming after you and you have to run quickly for your life and the life of the people you are trying to save. So these are, I'm just trying to tell you the setting where uh, you and staff working in the field are facing. It's uh, security challenges, legal challenges, uh, political challenges. Sometimes we have to be very cautious about the legal terms we use. In Syria, for example, the government, uh, in less than, I think, six months, I, I monitored 25 uh, arrests or detained uh, illegal cases. People have been detained, 25,000 people. And the Free Syrian Army was abducting also the Ba'athist party ruling in Syria so they can exchange with their loved ones. So the UN want to make a statement saying that they call all parties to release the detainees. We couldn't say the word detainees because detention is an act of a sovereign government. So if we use the, det the detainees, the detention, the, the Syrian government will kick us out of the country saying that you are giving a status of a government to the opposition and we call them terrorists. And at the same time, I couldn't use the word abduction because this means that I will label the, the opposition as criminals and they will not talk to us. So we have to invent as lawyers some neutral words. So we came with a term saying that we call all parties to refrain for forcibly the privation of liberty for the Syrian people. So we try to use a neutral legal terms that maintain our neutrality and our integrity and transparency with both parties so we can gain their trust or build their trust before <clears throat> building capacity for them. Um, I don't wanna like hijack this discussion. Um, I'm more interested to hear from you guys. It is, it is not a lecture by the way. I, I miss the, the classrooms. I, I consider myself now virtually with you. And if uh, Jean uh, 
allow me that I can stop here so I can give the floor for discussion. Uh, and we can take it from there. Over to you. Sure. Um, if you have questions, uh, there's a mic in front of you. You can just uh, talk on the mic and then uh, he will hear you. So the floor is open for discussion and questions. Did you say I just talk in it? Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you quite well. Okay, sure. Thank you so much for uh, for taking time to speak to us. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, it's really inspiring what what you what you do. I actually just wanted to find out, uh, you know, what what has been the most rewarding thing about working in this in these places that are that are different and that might be difficult, as you mentioned. Well, what have you found to be the most rewarding thing about all that? That's a very good question, actually. Um, well, let me start by giving you proverb. Uh, again, uh, I'm specialized in Islamic law. In Islamic legal system, there is a verse in the Quran, and I, by the way, I don't want to convert anyone to Islam. I'm just telling you in the justice way. There is a verse in the Quran saying that if you save one life, you save all humanity. And if you kill one human soul, you kill all humanity. So I think the value, the most valuable thing I, I'm doing, actually, is saving human soul. Saving the human life, protecting civilians in armed conflict. And usually in armed conflict, the most fragile member of society are women and children. So by having the UN there between the, the two armed groups, they always immediately stop from shooting and allowing us to get civilians out of the, um, like the crossfire between them. I remember once I was attending funeral in Syria. And usually the government used it because in, in this part of the world, funeral means all the village go outside to mourn the person who passed away. So the Syrian government uh, abused the situation and start killing a lot of people during this gathering. So the people start to be afraid attending funeral. So one of the um, activists who was killed, I went there and I said, I would like to attend his funeral. So I went with my car and as soon as the people saw my car, they start breaking it. They started vandalizing it. And I was surprised. About it. I know that they like the UN. They are not hating us. And I called the people who are organizing with them to be there. I told them why the people are doing this. They said the people want to be sure that I will not leave because if the UN car is in the middle, nobody will bombard the place. So they started actually flatting our tire, the car, to be, to be sure that we won't leave. So the car was vandalized simply because they are afraid of their life and they want to be sure that the UN will be there to protect them as a shield. So I think one of the valuable take for me to see uh, how people trust us and how we could really save lives at that moment. Like I told you, I, I managed to save some lives before shooting squad, shoot them by five minutes. But at the same time, and the frustration is, you have a lot of people with a very high expectation on the other side, I received a phone call at four o'clock in the morning in Syria, and there was a woman crying and the kids around her crying. She's calling me and saying, you are the UN observer. I said, yes, ma'am. She told me uh, the thugs from the government, they are going door to door in our neighbor, slaughtering them, and they are coming to us. Please, as the UN come now, take your helicopter now and save us. I told her, so ma'am, where are you talking? Where are you calling me? I don't know even where you are. Just give me your location. That's in 2012. So she start yelling and shouting and insulting me saying, how you stupid, uh, you are the UN, you have a satellite, you have your helicopter and you have your army, come and save us. This poor lady doesn't know that I don't have even a Swiss knife to protect myself. And as soon as I leave the, the hotel where I live, snipers start shooting our cars to refrain us from leaving the hotel. So sometimes people have high expectations. They think the UN are supermen, are superheroes, which is not true. So sometimes uh, the messaging from our side is very important, which is the PIO, public information uh, officers working with us to get the people back to reality, that we are there doing our best to protect them, but don't raise the seal of expectation because sometimes they are more disappointed and they get angry more and frustrated. So that's another take that we are, uh, I'm working on that. 
uh, professional level, I think it's uh, emotional for me to save lives, apply justice. And again, I think it's a visionist thing because when I worked in Afghanistan in law reform, I started drafting laws and they told me, you know, sir, uh, Dr. Muhammad, you know, that the person who drafted the Afghan criminal code was Egyptian professor in 1950. And I came 50 years later, another Egyptian, to work with them to, to formulate the justice system in their country for 50 years. So that's actually, you need a lot of vision. What do you think as a lawyer, when you draft law, how you would preserve the right of the minorities, women, children, uh, ethnic, ethnic groups, how you can preserve um, due process while you are drafting the law, how to make it functional. Because one of the other challenge I face that you find uh, colleagues um, in Sudan. One of our, my colleagues actually he has his doctorate degree in digital signature law. And he, as soon as he go to Sudan, he advised them that you guys have to have e-commerce and digital signature in a country that barely have electricity, not even uh, computers. So sometimes you have to be very realistic what, what the country needs and how the law, you might have a very good draft law, but it's only applicable in heaven, not on earth. So you have to be really realistic how these people and how the justice system will absorb this law. And if it will not be simple, that people could know their rights and simple for the judges to interpret it and not to abuse it, abuse it by misinterpreted the provision if it's sophisticated. So it's a challenge that we have to do, but it's a, it's a very um, challenging for mentality and uh, intellectuals that you, uh, you, as if you have a, like a crystal ball, you are looking at the same society 50 years from now, how you would like them to be by paving these laws for them. That's another thing I think it's one of the extremely interesting I did in these missions actually. Uh, okay, uh, Bernardo. Then, uh... Well, thank you very much for, for your words. Um, I love your comparison of, of law and justice to the camis and tuxedo. I think it's a very interesting way of putting it. And could, here, could you here. please, sorry, point of order, could you please, everyone who will take the floor, just introduce himself and where he's from so I can just put oh, yeah. face for a name? Sorry, uh, I'm here out in the back. Um, my name is Bernardo Pulido Marquez. I'm a JSD candidate from Venezuela. Um, so I was telling you, I love that comparison. And I do understand that law and justice looks different um, across the, the border and across the country. But my question, and you, and you mentioned a bit of this, is how do we deal with the tension of these differences and international standards? Because there are some things that we as a world community have already started to accept as general standards that should be uh, upheld everywhere across borders. So how, how do we deal with those tensions? And I, and I imagine that you find plenty of those issues in your day-to-day -day work. Thank you for the question. I think we, when we work, we have certain principles when we work with the UN. One of them is, first of all, security. We have to be sure that we can protect ourselves and protect our life because if we lose our life, we cannot help the people. So we always take clearance in when we go to place for security. Secondly, we always look also how uh, to understand the system, like I mentioned, um, and make it functional to everyone uh, and useful to them. Um, there was a couple of points I want to raise with you and it's out of my mind now. Um, could, you, could you repeat the last part of your question because the yeah. line was a little bit yeah, how do you deal with the, those tensions of, of typical tradition and ways of enforcing justice and Perfect. international standards? I can, I can tell you one of the good examples, uh, one, one or two examples. One of them in Afghanistan, um, the warlords, uh, most of the warlords in Afghanistan were members of the parliament at that time in 2005. Mm -hmm. And there was a report from Human Rights, uh, like uh, Human Rights Watch saying, that the member of the parliament in Afghanistan, a lot of them are war criminals and they need to be prosecuted and tried like Saddam Hussein who was <laughs> hanged at the time. So these warlords actually to protect themselves, they went to the Afghan parliament at the time saying, 
we defended Afghanistan from the Soviet invasion. So we protected Islam. We in the, we protected the the freedom of the Afghan. Who's against Islam? Who's against our independence? Nobody raised their hand. They said, "Okay, we would like to have a national reconciliation plan as a law that give us amnesty, that nobody can prosecute us for what happened during the war." So this draft law in the process in Afghanistan, it needed three readings to approve the law. So in the first reading, it was unanimously agreed upon that this law will pass. And it came to the UN to review it. And as the lawyer for the UN, the, the head of the legal department, rule of law, I looked at the law. I see that there are like warlords giving themselves impunity and amnesty from the crimes they commit. And they said, actually, they tried to label it with a religious uh, cover that nobody could attack, saying that Prophet Muhammad, when he opened Mecca, it was full of pagans who tortured and killed the Muslim. But when he went to Mecca, he granted amnesty to everyone. And we are following the prophet of forgiving everyone, and we grant amnesty to everyone. So no one will be prosecuted. So it came to me. And I, I, in this regard, to answer your question, because I come from international standards that uh, international or draft reaches of human rights, you cannot, like, you cannot have impunity for them. And you cannot run away from them. But at the same time, these guys are saying our culture as Muslims, we grant amnesty and we forgive. So, and the approach I approach, actually, I have our, my colleagues from Geneva, from the High Commissioner of Human Rights, they were up to the toes saying, you cannot let these guys go this way. We are against, this is against the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. This is against the UN declarations and the old instruments. And the reply came back from the government saying, you know what, we don't give them about international standards. We respect our religion and our culture. And this is how our laws are taken. So the SRSG or the special representative, the secretary general, who's the head of our mission, I am his advisor. He came to me and said, Muhammad, what do you think? How we can get, get out of this crisis? I told him, sir, I think this draft is unconstitutional because the constitution of Afghanistan is said that all the laws should be in conformity with Islamic law. And according to Islamic law, the only one who can grant amnesty is the victim. Not the president, nor the parliament. And thus, this means that this law is unconstitutional because these parliamentarians are granting amnesty for themselves. So I played the game the other way around. So I started approaching human rights bottom up, not top down. Not I'm going north from Geneva to Afghanistan. No, I'm going from Afghanistan to let them reach what Geneva as international standards we apply. And I spoke with a member of the parliament. I told them, the example you gave me, yes, Prophet Muhammad, when he opened Mecca, they grant amnesty to everyone except five people. And these five people who commit rape, torture, and killing. And these what now international standard called grave breaches of international human rights law. And guess what? International human rights develop, law developed from notions from Islam. So they was very proud that their religion was reflected and mirrored in the international law. And they said, so our Prophet Muhammad rules is in the international standards. I said, yes. So they said, OK, we will follow that, and we will not pass the law. And President Karzai refused to sign the law, and it was stopped. Although, of course, uh, some of these warlords actually passed by my compound, and they shoot rounds of machine guns in my office. So it was full of bullet holes, later on, like usual. <laughs> so I have bullet holes again as a threat. But at the end of the day, um, I use my talent as a lawyer trying to build a bridge between international standards and the morals and values of the society by starting from bottom up. Here is your values and here is the UN values. And you know what? There is a bridge between them, but there is a different terms and we can get them together. Thank you. I can tell you tons of stories about that. Yeah. Um, in the interest of time, we are going to take two uh, questions at the time. So Nicholas and is it Paloma or Angelica? Paloma and Nicholas. Nicholas first and then uh, Paloma second and then. Okay, Professor, I have a really short question. Given all your experience in the United Nations, what is the most important tool that you learned here at Notre Dame that was useful for all your professional experience? Like what, what advice do you give us uh, of something that we should 
really take advantage of being here at Notre Dame rather than other university. Like, what are specific tools you learned here that were useful for your experience? Hello, that's the first question. Second. Hello. Um, have you faced corruption within the um, the institution, the, the the United the United Nations, and how how have you dealt with it? Both of them are very good questions, actually. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, the setting of time where I worked, this was 20, 25 years ago. So what I found useful at the United Nations at that time, it might not be the same now for you, but like I find all the topics I learned at the Notre Dame, whether uh, international uh, public international law, international criminal law, uh, the legal, uh, the regional and international protection system of human rights in the inter-Americas, in Africa, uh, and in, in the League of Arab States, in Europe. These actually modalities of regional protection and, in, and in international modalities for protecting human rights, that's what I apply on a daily basis. And I learned it in Notre Dame, how to protect human rights from a different continents and how the approach of procedures, justice are approached. So all of them are good. So try to seize the opportunity um, and learn as much as possible that uh, something that will be useful for you guys. Um, one of the things, again, challenging for you now with the artificial intelligence that uh, I've attended very nice workshop about artificial intelligence and how it will impact the profession uh, labor market. They say that uh, the profession of accountant, bankers, doctors, lawyers, will be soon uh, very limited in the future because artificial intelligence can do it, the, the business of lawyers, but not the business of judges because artificial intelligence don't have the conscious of judges. But yet as a judge you have, or as a lawyer, you have to find tools to work with artificial intelligence, for example. So how could you use this new technology to apply justice, for example? Um, but for the field of human rights, definitely, I would ask you to, to focus on the international and regional instruments of protection of human rights. Um, one of the things I did, I don't want to have people go through it well, uh, because it, it, it doesn't exist over there, but uh, I studied Islamic law, which is very rare, and that's make me unique in the market. That's why whenever I, I go to a system, um, uh, this is make me a bonus from other, other lawyers in the West. Other bonus, how many languages you know? So a lot of uh, crises are happening in the Middle East. So if you know Arabic, that would be a, a plus. If you know Sharia, that would be a plus. Uh, also in Africa, if you know French, that would be plus as well. So these are things that if you prepare yourself with a different language, um, would help you a lot in the labor market later. Like I told you, every post to the UN, there is a 30,000 person waiting to take it. So you have to be very competitive. Corruption. So uh, the, answering the question of uh, corruption, yes. Uh, corruption, we, uh, it's, if you see corruption, human being, uh, the, the, the phenomena of corruption, it's, uh, it's all in all communities. There is no community of angels. Corruption exists. And there is a whistleblower in different missions, as you can see, of uh, sexual abuse and uh, embezzlements and things like that. But the UN is doing a system that minimizes the amount of corruption, uh, monitor situation. Uh, if you see something wrong, you should report it. And we have modalities. We have the ombudsman, we have the legal office, office of conduct and discipline. So we have modalities of internal oversight and inspection. I remember when I was in Sudan, uh, I was the head of rule of law, justice and correction. And since I'm a senior person with a law background, I've been entitled of investigating cases of a senior staff who have been allegations of this staff of sexually abusing other staff or sexually abusing nationals or uh, embezzlement or fraudulent act, abusing of position. And I investigated that seriously. And most of them were held accountable. They were sacked out of the system. Of course, they were fired. And most of them were sent back to the countries asking them to follow with accountability. So you and take this seriously, especially with sexual uh, assaults and sexual uh, cases and crimes. This is zero tolerance from that. The people will be fired immediately. Thank you, Dr. 
Um, two more questions. We only have five minutes to go. Um, Anshu and Rokia. Uh, I'm Anshu. I'm from India. I have worked mostly on death penalty issues and I'm here for LLM human rights. Uh, so thank you for explaining the kind of uh, work you and us. I had a very childish notion that doing job is boring. Uh, am I audible to you? I can, I can hardly hear you. There is a lot of distortion in the mic. Can am you repeat slowly what you're saying? Am I audible to you now? Yeah. Yes. I'm Anshu. I'm an LLM human rights candidate uh, currently from India. I, I used to think that the UN work is uh, boring and office work. So thank you for clarifying what the work is. During my work, I have come across lots of issues which cause trauma to the person who is doing the work. So I'd like to know from you how you personally deal with the trauma you come across during your work. Say so you mentioned uh, the children you saw, dead, dead bodies of children in Syria and all. So how you deal with that trauma? The second one and the last one. Okay, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you quite loud and clear. Yeah, Salam Alaikum. Uh, I'm Rokia Samim. I'm from Afghanistan and LLM International Human Rights Law student here. Uh, thank you so much for taking time and sharing your experience with us. It is really helpful for me as I want to pursue my career in the UN after finishing my studies. And somehow the thing you shared with us was uh, familiar with me because I worked as UN staff in Afghanistan, UNAMA. So I know how difficult it is to put yourself in at risk and we are those personal protection equipment and helmets uh, and helmet, helmets and go to the, the most unsafe areas. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. And my question is, uh, you know, as I said, my plan is to pursue my career after uh, finishing my studies in UN. What are the most effective ways to, you know, to enter the UN? Uh, being as a human rights lawyer, I just wanted to be some something about this. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll try to be very brief because of the stick of time. Uh, answering the first question, post-traumatic syndrome, uh, we have uh, psychiatrists and psychologists working with us. It took me six months to recover from what I saw in Syria. Um, the lady that was calling me through the phone asking for my help and insulting, saying, where are you? Help us. She was slaughtered while she was talking to me. I, the guy like slaughtered her alive on, when she was on the phone and he hanged the phone. I couldn't sleep for, for a week after that. That was four o'clock in the morning. Uh, so we go through actually after finishing these hazard areas, we go, we have psychologists that we sit with them, trying to ba go back to normality, trying to separate between our job and our family. Uh, try to go back to be a father and a husband, trying to engage again and appreciate and cherish life, appreciate life, appreciate peace. I remember I was living in Chicago when I was working in a place like Syria. We couldn't walk in the street because uh, snipers were everywhere. So we move from bunkers to armored cars to bunkers. So the first thing I do whenever I go to Chicago, and it was like 20 below zero or 30 below zero, I just walk in the street. I said, just the blessing of being free and safe and secure, that's something very important. So yes, we have modalities to protect us from post-traumatic syndrome after post-conflict. Answering your question, Rukhaya, alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Give me one second, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. Um, we have um, this session on December 6th about the, how to get to the UN, and that will be with you again. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> So yeah. that's keeping the suspense, actually, so yeah. we can meet again. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much, Dr. Rahim. And uh, it's 1.24. We appreciate your time and uh, all the uh, expert advice that you've given us. And uh, with that said, uh, I would like to thank you and then invite the uh, attendees to the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Enjoy the rest of Bon Appetit. Thank you. All right, guys. Uh, we have to work in. Thank you again for attending. And uh, for those of you who are not LLM, you are invited to uh, all of our 
registering at 12.30 every Monday. So feel free to uh, just walk in.